record on this computer. Go to Sean. Okay, you are now the host. And All right. Let's see, I will get my PowerPoint going here. All right, is everybody seeing it okay? Not yet. It should come up shortly. Okay, give it a, give it a minute here. Yeah, it takes a second or two to pop up. Are you sharing your screen? Did you hit share screen? Yeah, yep, I should have. Let's see. Let's make sure. Oh, hang on here. I'm working off two, so. There you go. It's coming up now, Sean. Sure. Okay. 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 Right. okay. Good deal. Good deal. Let me get it. There you go. Get the full size. How's that? You got it. All right. Um, the the picture that's on the front of this screen is supposed to be from the 1974 tornado, but uh, I think it's probably appropriate, um, especially when you think about the fact that the tornado originally would have been coming in over what we would kind of think of as unincorporated Louisville, uh, over an area that uh, probably looked a lot like what we're seeing in the screen. Probably not as quite as nice of a roadway but much of the terrain would have been about the same. Uh, my name's Sean Heron. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm doing this presentation is because in addition to being an attorney, as you'll see on the screen, uh, I'm also an emergency manager. And I've, I've kind of looked at this cyclone, tornado, twister, whatever you want to look at it, from the point of view of what would we do if it hit now? Uh, where would it hit? what buildings would have been struck and uh, what the response would have been. Because I think uh, it's important to remember that this is not unique. Uh, it could certainly happen again. If you think about what Louisville was back in 1890, it's probably not gonna be tremendously different from what it looked like in 1875. I like this map because it, it really shows what Louisville was at the time, um, what the, where the edges were. If you're familiar with the, the layout of the map of Louisville now, you can see Portland as its own little separate community. And you kind of get an idea on the eastern side. Uh, it runs about where, if you remember where the cutoff is, uh, which is where the Beargrass Creek pumping station is now, right there at the foot of Story in that area. The little piece that sticks out there at the bottom is the House of Refuge, which is, of course, anybody know? U of L. Property U of L. Um, so if you look at it and you can kind of get oriented, that's what I like this particular map. Parkland, which we're going to talk about, is its own separate community at the time. Uh, it, it, was, it was pretty new. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. But it isn't part of the city of Louisville, but it, it's, it's going to factor quite heavily in what we're going to talk about. Before the tornado, um, thriving city. I mean, we had 161,000 in the city. And remember, we're talking about that area that we already showed. And if you think about the pre-merger population of the city of Louisville, which would have been physically a little bigger than that city of Louisville that we've talked about. Uh, we're talking about a, a pretty dense city at that point. Um, the Kentucky Derby had already been running for 15 years. And I will note the Kentucky Derby is going to run in 1890. It, it's, it runs on May 14th. Anybody, without Googling, anybody remember who won in 1890? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the horse's name was Riley and was ridden by the uh, extremely well-known jockey, Isaac Murphy. Um, at that time, if you recall, Derby was, was kind of moving around with respect to date. It was May 14th is what it ran in that year. But uh, when you're looking at the, you know, the date, which for those who aren't familiar with it, this, this is going to be March 27th, um, and it's going to run on May 14th. That's, that's pretty quick. They, they look about the recovery time that they were able to still run run the Derby that same year. What's the weather and what do we do with weather? I've got a good friend who's a meteorologist and uh, 
he's fascinated by by cyclones and tornadoes and does in fact do some uh, storm chasing for UPS and for his own own benefit. Um, and I've learned a lot about weather from him. Weather forecasting. Um, 1870, the president at the time, Ulysses Grant, had decided that it was going to be important for weather to get out there. So he appointed it uh, to the responsibility of the U.S. Army Signal Service. They would then telegraph out to all the newspapers around civilization, telling them what the weather was going to be and what their predictions were. But uh, as we will see, they really weren't necessarily very accurate um, in terms like of today. places. Like today. Uh, well, they're a little better today, but they were definitely not accurate on March 27th. Um, the morning, if you, if you would have read the paper that morning, this is what you would have seen for the day uh, for Kentucky. And, and what's the problem with that when you say for Kentucky? I mean, we're talking about a state, a large area. Uh, it did say it was going to be fair and that we were going to have some rain over in the western portion, so Paducah and Owensboro, and that the temperature would say pretty stationary. I think they might have been right on that last point, <laughs> but uh, as you will see, uh, things changed. As it went on, um, they were getting some warnings from the signal service that there were going to be some potentially violent atmospheric conditions because the bar uh, barometer was dropping. And of course, that's, that's an indicator that we're going to have a problem. Unlike today, there's really no ready way to quickly tell the public. I mean, the general public was going to be going on, on their usual way. Um, anybody hear the sirens, by the way? this past week. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the sock, we did have, have our, our uh, spring tornado warning and uh, who didn't hear the sirens? Anybody not hear the sirens? I don't think I did. Yeah, I did not. Um, a lot depends upon, we, we, we talk a lot about tornado sirens now, but a lot depends upon where you are whether you're inside or outside, and uh, precisely what way, you know, which way the wind's blowing at any given time. I did not hear the sirens, and I know where the, si the closest siren is to my house, but I did not hear the sirens, and I usually don't if I'm in the house. I have to be outside in order to hear them. Uh, they're not designed or intended to penetrate most modern houses. Uh, so what should you have as an alternative now? Weather radio, <laughs> alert on your phone. Um, I, I get about six alerts. <laughs> so if you don't, if you don't have a way to hear the weather, it's important to, to get some way to hear the weather because uh, on March 27, 1890, people in Louisville had no idea what was coming. Uh, even if they looked up in the sky, they would have had no way of knowing. So as day went on. Um, about 7 and 8 p.m. And, uh, and I always think in terms of, you know, what are you doing between 7 and 8 p.m. on a Thursday evening? A lot of people in Louisville were out attending various meetings, which uh, was the social activity of the day. Um, you, you didn't get to stay home and listen to the radio, watch television, watch Netflix. You were probably, probably out and about or sitting at home having supper and reading, you know, whatever other activities you might do in the evening. It was a massive tornado. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about the actual size of it in modern terms. But if you think about the geography, it, it actually entered coming first through what was, as we now know, the city of Parkland, crossed the western portion of Louisville proper, uh, left the city at about second in, or excuse me, seventh in the river, crossed over the Ohio River um, and did some damage and will come back, which uh, before that, there was obviously a small settlement outside the city that had hit first called Cane Run, also known as where? Cane Run Road. Shively. That was, yeah, Shively. It would have come through that area, but um, 
that really wasn't populated in the way obviously it is now. If it were to come through now, again, think about what it would already hit before it's even come to the, the edge of the city of Louisville now. Crossed over into Indiana, did some damage over there, uh, decided to make a turn and came back into Kentucky and primary destruction at that point was the water tower at Zorn and River, which would have been on the edge of the city at the time but obviously an extremely important structure. At the time, and, and we, in Louisville, we think about, oh gosh, it just hit us. It's kind of the same way we think about the 1937 flood. It just hit us. It didn't. Um, it was one of 13 recorded tornadoes that day that struck and killed hundreds of people. In numbers right now, it ranks as the 26th deadliest tornado uh, we were number 25 until Joplin a few years ago. Joplin pushed us out of the uh, the 25th spot and into the 26th. Um, massive, massive tornado, even by even by what we look at today. While obviously the 1974 tornado was a massive tornado, we were we were blessed because of some of these changes that we talked about, not having the the fatalities that came as a result of 1890. Coming through Parkland, uh, getting to some of the details. Uh, Parkland was established as its own community, its own city in 1871 thereabouts. Uh, it really took off in the 1880s because now you could live in the suburbs and still get to work. Uh, we don't think of Parkland now obviously as being that far away from downtown, but if you were gonna walk it, it was gonna take a while. So having the ability to, to catch a streetcar there on Broadway uh, meant you were getting back and forth to work pretty quickly. Uh, the streetcar system was, was very extensive in Louisville. Um, there's, you know, Bert and Sally are mules. I don't know, obviously, if that's the mules, but uh, that's what you would have been riding on, basically. Um, how many people wish we had streetcars today? Um, I'd ride them. Uh, uh, buses are okay, but streetcars are cool. Primary commercial district, which is still the commercial district on Dumanil between 26 and 28, and residences fanned out. This photo purports to be from Parkland. I, I can't attest to it, but it would have been similar type housing in, in some of these, because these were very, very nice houses and still are, if, if you're familiar with Parkland. Some of, the, some of the houses that are original uh, are beautiful. Uh, one thing I, I'm gonna note about this picture is where's the damage? Damage is in the upper stories. And, and right. as we go through and look at a lot of these pictures, pay attention to where on the building the damage actually is. The uh, Parkland I, I, I'll note is kind of special to me because my first, the first place I remember my mom working was at the corner of 28th and Dumanil. That was her, where her workplace was. So I'm quite familiar with Parkland. Eventually Parkland uh, was not going to recover. Uh, it, it suffered so much damage that it decided it would be annexed. And I'm sure there were other reasons as well. But by 1894, the area now known as Parkland as a neighborhood then joined the city of Louisville and became uh, became part of it, just like Portland had done earlier. Uh, huh. Coming in, there, you're going to see a couple of different maps. Uh, this one was from the Courier Journal a few days later, uh, approximately a week later. Um, it gives somewhat of an idea. You can orient if you again if you're familiar with the layout of Louisville, approximately where it went, and you can see that sweep coming around to the right which is when it would have come back in and struck the water tower. Um, 18th and Maple is where, if you were actually coming into the city of Louisville, that's basically where it entered. Um, that's for reference purposes. Those folks who might be familiar where the new YMCA is, that's 18th and Maple. Uh, it's the Y is between Broadway and Maple. So as we go through here again, just keep thinking about what's there now, what's there now. It kind of crossed over um, past 17th and Broadway. We'll see some damage there. I'm gonna be showing some pictures in a few minutes. 
16th and Chestnut, 12th and Jefferson, you see the track, crosses Main and Market to the Union Depot at the foot of 7th Street, where it's going to cross over the river, strike Jeffersonville, and come back. I keep reiterating that because I want you to think about what that track actually was and how wide it was. We're going to talk about the width of it in a minute. This is another uh, image, and I really like this article. It's from Scientific American, which uh, if anybody's familiar with that periodical, really has some fascinating, uh, very timely articles about things that occurred. Um, if anybody's familiar with the collapse of the Big Four Bridge about this same time frame, a really interesting article about that as well. Uh, you'll notice this track is a little, a little bit different. It's a little, I think, a little more precise in that it seems to show uh, that little bit of a waver as it comes across. Uh, what do you notice about downtown, about the track in downtown? It's a little bit wider. Yeah. It's a little bit wider yeah. and it comes right through downtown, uh, which expanded out and then it narrows as it hits that little tip of Jeffersonville that it's kind of brushes the tip of Jeffersonville. But that's still a lot of damage in Jeffersonville. And then coming across to the right where the water tower was, Again, this was populated, but it certainly wasn't populated to the extent downtown Louisville was. Um, the one thing, again, I, I go back to, I um, do emergency management work. Uh, it's dark. Um, you know, what's happened at this point? We've lost the electricity we had because how was electricity carried and mostly still carried today? Poles. Yeah, lines. poles. Um, you know, you're going to, it's going to tear down all what little electricity they may have probably had in parts of the city, which was actually pretty, pretty, pretty extensive. Uh, you've lost all that. Um, do you have flashlights? No. What are you going to use instead? Gas yeah. lights. Yeah, you've got, <laughs> and keep in mind, you, if you sheared off anything gas line, what are you going to have? A fire. You're going to have fires, um, you're probably going to be depending upon lanterns for light and lanterns, of course, use what? Kerosene. <laughs> and kerosene. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, you don't have EMS. Uh, we do have police and we do have the Louisville Fire Department, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. But you don't have EMS in the sense uh, you're, you're going to be dependent upon your friends and neighbors to, to get you to medical help. Uh, which is probably not going to be the hospital. It, it's going to be to nearby doctors uh, as opposed to everybody going to the hospital. Uh, you're not going to have any radio communication with public safety. All the things that we would think would be the response today were not going to be possible. It, it's going to be dark. Um, and when you really think, except for where there were fires, there's, it's going to be a pretty dark night at this point. Well, few hours later, and you figure that this is now mm, probably 12 to 14 hours later, it's um, sun's going to come up because that is fortunately something we can usually count on. Um, this is when people are really going to really be understanding. Certainly individuals who are close enough to downtown are going to know what has occurred. Uh, friends and neighbors would have sought help. They would have probably rushed to the scene to provide assistance. But there's probably a lot of people in the city of Louisville and the area around it that don't really know what's occurred at this point. Um, I'm, I'm old enough. I don't know if I want to admit this, but I'm old enough to remember the 1974. And I was 14 at the time and lived in an area that was not struck by the tornado at all. And we really didn't know what had occurred. Even in 1974, we did not realize until several hours later how extensive the damage was in another part of the state, or excuse me, another part of the city. We just didn't know. I, I actually went to Actors Theater that night, totally unaware of the amount of damage that had occurred. The production, by the way, was the miracle worker, and there were only 25 people there. Oh, but, gosh. Uh, I mean, I, it's one of those distinctive memories. We had, had tickets from school, and um, 
and I go back to think about that. Why didn't we know? And the reality was information just wasn't communicated in the same way as it is now. We, we've learned a lot. Um, but as people started to realize, and I'll know, I, I think probably many of the, the, the folks that are listening know that back then the newspapers could not produce photographs. They could not put a photograph in the newspaper. The alternative was they would have people taking pictures and then artists would draw the picture. And that would be what would, they would see in the newspaper. So many of these images were probably drawn, probably with a little bit of imagination in the sense of the one that we're looking at on the screen. But many of the pictures you're going to see are pretty accurate reproductions of photographs that were taken as well. And it's always interesting when you find the photograph and, the, and compare it to the drawn image in those cases where you can do so. What do we have? Uh, we got Main Street from 7th to 12th. Uh, again, think about what's there now, it was pretty much in ruins. Um, Market Street from Jefferson, 10th Street to 13th Street, Walnut from 13th to 15th. And is, again, if you think about these blocks, you're, you're moving westward on these blocks because that's where the track of the tornado was. Uh, Chestnut from 13th to 17th, so it, it's all shifting to the west slightly when you look at those blocks. Um, and what's there? A lot of residences, a lot more residents than we have there now. A lot of that area now is commercial, but uh, there were just residents upon residents upon residents in that area. I like this term, um, Courier Journal called it the whirling tiger of the air. Uh, there, there are other other terms, the death dropping from above, but they um, they recognized how horrific what had occurred. And again, by the way, you're you're also printing a newspaper in the middle of all this. My my background years back was working for the Courier Journal, and we had to put together newspapers in the middle of disasters before, and that uh, is a tough job to do. But they needed to get the news out. This was the front page the next morning, um, death and disaster. You see the photograph on there. Uh, a good part of that edition, uh, wrap around, you're gonna see if you go through this newspaper, a lot more information, obviously. Uh, this was front page news for weeks in, in one way, shape or form. Um, I, if you're familiar with the newspapers of the time, you'll see the the sequential headlines that dropped down. That was a common, a common way of doing it at, at, the, at the time. Uh, this is purported to be 18th and Broadway and I don't have any real reason to doubt that. That would have been the type of thing that you would have seen. And again, look at the damage. Where's the damage? Top? Top, yeah. Top of the yeah, buildings. You're seeing roof. Yeah, you're seeing roofs. Um, I, I'm assuming a lot of that debris that you're seeing on the ground is the roof. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of folks standing yeah. around, uh, I, and I, I, I will admit I find a slight bit of amusement when you look at some of these folks, because look at the look at the individuals standing there, and think look at how they're dressed. Um, they got their hats, they got their top coats. You know, they're dealing with a disaster scene, but they've got their top coats and their hats. Uh, what would you hope people would be wearing today if they were responding to that? A um, little more, hopefully a little more protective gear than what we're seeing these individuals wear, but um, the, a lot of damage. You see, you know, it's just a tremendous amount of de debris that, uh, are these buildings going to survive? I don't know, the one right in the, the foreground that, with, that has the, the porch, uh, that one kind of looks bad. The one over to the left, eh, it might make it. Uh, if they put any roof on it, it might be okay. Um, Fall City Hall was, um, I guess, ground zero. Fall City Hall was a social hall. There were quite a few social halls, places where people had meetings, located at 1108 West Market. Uh, what's, what's, if I know offhand, what's between 11th and 12th on Market now? If I visualize nature terrace um it's I, it's where the big mercer trucking oh, okay right folks are. 
Yeah, the big Mer if you go to if you go to the big Mercer trucking area down there, that's that's kind of the area that we're talking about right there. And this was clearly a large social hall when you when you look at, at images uh, of it standing, it's a big place. And that's where people went to have meetings, to take classes. It, it was well, a lot of people in that vicinity probably spent maybe a couple nights a week there. So it was it was second home for a lot of folks. Um, you see the horse-drawn carriages, that the one is, is not a great image. The one on the right's a pretty sharp image and gives you an idea of the debris. And all that debris's gotta go somewhere. The, the debris management is its own field now in emergency management. What do you do with all of that? Local chapter of the Knights and Ladies of Honor, which was a, an organization, a lot of people belong that. The Roman Knights, they were really like the term Knights back then. <laughs> um, other organizations were meeting. There was a dance class with children in the lower level. So think about that from a, a point of view of responding. And where, where were mom and dad if the kids were in a dance class in the lower level? In the hallway. Mom waiting. and dad were hallway probably hallway. upstairs attending their own meetings. So you're going to have whole families that were affected by this. Uh, look, at, look at the debris field. I mean, I don't know. I don't know its construction, obviously. But... Um, it really got struck and look at the buildings surrounding it. Kind of look at the edge. You see a lot of those buildings seem to have survived. So I don't know what was so vulnerable about that particular building, but it would collapse in the way that it did when buildings nearby seem to have survived reasonably okay, reasonably intact. Um, this is a really good, good image. There's our individuals with his top hat. Um, standing in the middle of the debris field, not a place I would want to be. Uh, you see a lot of collapse. And again, look at the wall to the, to the side. It looks pretty good. It looks, it looks pretty intact. But right behind it, it looks that one building looks like it's probably lost its front, but the walls are still standing. But the debris field that you're looking at is mostly Fall City Hall. Mm. This one, uh, I, I really appreciate because again it, it still shows the buildings around including the one to the what would would be to the side of it that looks reasonably intact one thing i find interesting about a couple of these because obviously we're talking about raw well, photography was pretty advanced it still wasn't a snapshot uh, you can see a lot of blurring uh, which tells you that these individuals were all actively working to, uh, to assist now, you know, where are our victims at this point? Under the debris field in some cases, uh, especially the children. Right. Originally they believed, and again, numbers are tough. Uh, it's just extremely difficult to know for sure how many people ultimately were killed. I'll, I'll discuss that in a little bit, but uh, they do believe, you know, 40 to 50 people have perished or were from being crushed or suffocated as a result. Uh, that is an illustration of what the building looked like before. Don't we wish we had that building today? Um, and then a, and then a, it's just a neat looking building. Kind of, uh, Steve, that kind of looks a lot like the Oddfellows building in some yeah. ways. <laughs> the right. same, uh, you know, the same, the same kind of idea. Correct. Uh, and that would have, I mean, if you really think about it, it would have been a similar type usage where there would have been different activities going on, meetings. Um, what's going to happen to all those individuals who are trapped? You know, we, we focus a lot of times on the fatalities, but if these individuals are trapped, they're suffering fairly grievous injuries as a result of being trapped, even if ultimately they are able to be recovered from the, from the wreckage. This is, this is the one that I think that I really like because it really shows just about every end of person image in this is moving. Uh, what were they doing? They were trying their best to get these, these folks out of there. The, the tornado views, I, I, you kind of have to wonder having a book of views of a tornado, but uh, put together what sells and people wanted to know. And this is how people out in the community and people in other states actually learned about it, but 
Um, this image, you know, what do you see a lot of in this image at the bot toward the bottom of the image? What is that? Brick, I guess. That's bricks. And bricks are heavy and bricks are hard to move. And you've got victims. Uh, just, I just can't even begin to think when we look at a still image like that, you don't get the appreciation of um, the temperature. You don't get the appreciation of the noise, um, potentially people calling for help. Uh, you don't get the smell. You don't get all of those things when you're, when you're looking at, a, at an image. But I want you to think about that as we go through here. Uh, this is a, a stereo, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, stereoscope view. Yeah. You will see more of those. Um, uh, and I know many people are familiar with the idea of this giving kind of a three-dimensional effect if you were to look through this. Uh, and having done so, I, it does give you a, an interesting three-dimensional effect, but you're going to see some of these images as we go through. This particular one indicates that there were 75 killed. Um, that's, that's high. Uh, that's more than what is currently documented. But they didn't know. Uh, the, the numbers were, were going to be iffy and, and are still iffy. Uh, Jack and I have talked a lot about the list and how difficult it is to correlate how many people were actually definitively killed. Um, St. John's Episcopal Church, um, Leventh and Jefferson, it was destroyed. You can see the, the degree of damage uh, that is done there. Um, beautiful church, you know, a terrible loss as well. When you think about all these beautiful buildings that were lost and the residences and the livelihoods I, I, that were destroyed as a result of this. But in this particular church, the pastor um, and his son Dudley, who was four, were killed as a result of this. His wife and three other children did escape. Um, you know, again, they were just, they would have been presumably at that time, I'm presuming they were in uh, the, the, the dwelling unit as opposed to the actual church at the time. But obviously all the buildings right there were, were heavily damaged as a result. Baxter Square, uh, what's Baxter Square now? It's still Baxter Square. Yeah. But it was the old the Pioneer <laughs> Cemetery. It's the, the old cemetery. Um, and yeah, what's interesting is, again, I, I like the fact you still have that. I'm going to presume that's probably the original concrete coping that you still see around the, uh, the location. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what happened to the fence. It may have fallen foul to the uh, World War II, I think it was, where they were pulling up a lot of the, the ironwork and, and using it. Uh, I've always had my personal suspicions about this fence. Um, and it's just my personal suspicion that this might be the fence that they took down from around the courthouse. Um, because there originally was a, a fence of a very similar look around the courthouse. Uh, that was taken down uh, 1,400 foot of it and sold. And I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to know where pieces of that fence ended up. But this, that actually, this actually does look a very similar design to that fence. Um, and again, when you, what's what's across the street, by the way, from Baxter Square now? Baxter and what? Uh, the, Baxter Square is actually at 12th and Jefferson. Oh, okay. Is the fire is headquarters? I didn't know. Our headquarters is directly across the street. There are apartments. Um, this is the edge of Beecher Terrace as well. Um, so you're seeing a lot of, of damage here. Um, you know, people posing, I, I guess, just like now, if somebody pulls out a camera, somebody's going to pose. Even though it's in the middle of destruction, somebody's going to pose. Um, we also have these, these young youngsters who are... Uh, just standing around probably thinking this is their you know this is the playground that they would normally have been going to uh look at the look at the the poles right above them think yeah. about that look at the yeah. amount of damage and what it took to burn the, to just turn those poles in the direction that they did mm. uh, and again and look beyond look look at the building that's just beyond those poles uh, see some damage there as well but you're not seeing damage on the ground and I'm going to keep, going to keep emphasizing that yeah. it, rarely did you see any any 
pictures that showed ground damage until we get a little bit farther in the track. These are, this, this tornado has not touched down effectively. It's still skimming the, skimming the rooftops. Dr. Griffiths, uh, he, his house was struck 1100 block of West Jefferson. So again, the track's pretty wide, pretty wide at this point when you're looking at what's actually been hit. And this also, one thing I'll, I'll note, this also illustrates how many residences there were. And when we, we saw the Beecher Terrace thing a few, couple of weeks ago, they talked about these residences. These are the residences that were there prior to what the current construction is. 13th and Walnut, there's another Odd Fellows Hall. Uh, I yeah. felt that was gonna be timely for today. Um, this, this Odd Fellows Hall had an African -Amer American membership. Um, it would survive, by the way, it would survive this, this while this, seeing a tremendous amount of damage, it was rebuilt and continued in use till uh, unfortunately, so many of the buildings in that area were taken down with urban renewal. It, it, it did survive. This, this one was reconstructed and brought back into use. More damage to it. Uh, look at those windows. That's just such a neat building. It's, it's such a loss to lose those kind of buildings. Some businesses, these, these are just gonna be some, some assorted images. And again, pay attention to where the damage is. Uh, look at the debris uh, front. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that sign over in the corner survived. When you look at the damage behind it, but you've got a sign that survives that doesn't look like it's that substantial of a sign. If you've ever seen tornado damage, you will see that type of situation where the track is so, the edge is so fine that you can get a tremendous amount of damage and just a few feet away, nothing. It's, it's astounding to look at. Uh, I like this one. Uh, this one's uh, Main Street, I believe. It's hard to really tell sometimes when you read the bottoms, but I'm pretty sure that's Main Street. Uh, frontage is gone. Uh, it kind of looks a lot like the Oklahoma City building in some ways with the frontage being destroyed. Uh, what are all those lines across the picture? It's not damage to the picture. Telephone lines. No, not telephone, telephone lines. lines. Electrical lines. We electrical have telephone lines. lines. Yeah, electrical lines and telephone lines both most likely. Yeah. So again, yeah. you're looking at a lot of uh, risk and danger and potential for fire because we're looking at a lot of wooden debris yeah. that was taken out. Uh, just, just, when you think about these risks, I'm not positive, but I kind of get the feeling that wagon in the middle is an undertaker's wagon um, just because of the style of it. Um, uh, I've always, always wondered about that. It's hard to really see some of the things that are written on these images, but it, the style is certainly consistent. The Louisville Hotel, uh, along with Fall City uh, Hall, were probably the two primary areas where we had a lot of fatalities. So on Main Street near 7th Street, uh, a wall of it, a lot of the damage, the, the wall came off and fell onto the much shorter building before. You're going to see an image on that in just a moment. As many as, as nine women, uh, including hotel laundresses, they lived on the upstairs, kind of the garret of the hotel. And again, where was the damage to these buildings? At the top. Um, that's where they would have been, been staying. It would have been, that would have been where their rooms were. Uh, I did make a, a little trip out, a little side trip out to St. Louis Cemetery to see some of the graves of some of the individuals. Uh, Mary McGinty, who was obviously from where? Ireland. Ireland. Uh, yeah, these were Irish ladies. Uh, were buried out in St. Louis, so we presumptively Catholic. Uh, she's buried um, she out in St. Louis. Um, that This is her stone. It's sometimes hard to read these stones because of the uh, amount of, of damage and just age that has gone on them and the, and the moss and such that has grown but that is her stone almost directly you'll see another her, her stone is slightly to the side of these two stones Bridget Crow was another one of the ladies who passed away 
Her sister-in-law, Julia, which is who she shares the stone with, uh, died of typhoid several months later. I, I don't know that there was any connection. Uh, both of them were young women. Um, this stone was presumably erected by Julia's husband, who was also Bridget's brother, is who would have erected the stone. But they, but they received a joint stone uh, in a similar style to the one we just saw. Uh, other women were, were buried. These, these folks apparently were a little better, better equipped to, uh, to pay for such burials, although we'll talk about in a second how they handled that. That, that, uh, this that, is, that monument looks expensive. Uh, it was. I dare say that was an expensive monument. Uh, I think the family probably had a little more money than a lot of the individuals that were killed. So uh, they I'll, weren't I'll laundresses. Talk. They were not laundresses. No, I think I think that the uh, I don't think Bridget Crow was, but she apparently was employed by the Louisville Hotel in some capacity because she did pass away in the upper floors, best we can tell. Um, okay. I like this this image. This shows the hotel, which is the taller building. You see the damage on the side of the hotel, which would have been that upper floor, as it fell into. The, uh, the lower building. And I, I like this image because it does indicate that there was a photo taken by Frank Wybrandt who, who took a lot of these photos that this drawing was taken from. So uh, I'd love to find the extent image. I don't have any hopes that I ever will, but I'd love to see the original image on that. But they tended to do a pretty accurate job of, of illustrating on these. Union Depot was, was next in line. Um, 7th Street near the river, completely destroyed. There were a lot of people inside. Uh, I would think by this time they probably figured out what was going on because uh, anybody ever been in close proximity to a tornado? Nope. What's it sound like? Loud. A railroad. Loud. Exactly. That's that's what everybody always Female comes promoter. back to. It sounds like the lo locomotive is coming. And uh, of course, this was a railroad station, so they probably heard that quite a bit. But I think the volume was probably considerably higher. Um, so by that time, I, the reality, though, is where would you go if you knew this was coming? Underground. <laughs> Underground, but unfortunately, as we saw at Falls City Hall, what happens? You have the debris field falling on top of you. Yeah. Um, I do have quite a, I, the impression I got, and I, I've seen some other images of similar type situations in other places. Uh, where would be the safest place, do you think, to be if you're at the railroad station? The bathroom. <laughs> I, what's interesting is many of them apparently may have gotten into the cars. Because the cars would have been the railroad cars may have been the strongest thing possible, yeah. and when you look oh. at it, look at this image, you see a car kind of sitting, kind of almost overturned on the side. Um, that car looks reasonably intact, so that might have been the safest place to be in a train car, if presumably the train train cars are not actually lifted up and moved around. But even if they are, you're in a probably the safest place you're going to have in that particular area. They did have a lot of injuries. Obviously, we had a, a pretty extensive collapse of the uh, the train shed. I think that's the train shed. It looks a lot like uh, the roof line and such of what the train shed would have looked like. Uh, this gives you another some more views of it. You see the framework of it, uh, how many tracks that were down there, uh, which we don't have anymore, obviously. Tobacco districts, more pictures. Uh, one on the, the black and white image is very nice and sharp and I think does an excellent job of kind of giving you an idea of how much damage you were actually seeing. And again, what's where's the damage? Where's the damage to these buildings? Roofs. Roofs. Yeah, we're still looking at roofs, um, it, it, which it again says it was not on the ground. Had it been on the ground, what would it have looked like? I mean, yeah. it, it would have been pretty much wiped clean. If we've seen some of the some of the images from Joplin, for example, really give you an idea of what 
the tornado on the ground will look like. Uh, many of these buildings survived because they simply put a new roof back on them. Uh, another image in that area, again, a little more damage to the building there. You see it kind of almost like a bite taken out of it. Uh, a lot of collapse in the background. I don't think I'd want to be trying to work with that. And again, a lot of people, a lot of people are out um, probably trying to figure out what to do because you've got to start. Main Street, um, a lot of collapse. Uh, again, I'm showing a lot of images because I just want you to kind of be thinking in terms of what's there now. What's on Main between 11th and 12th now? Mercer Transportation, mostly. Mercer <laughs> Transportation, mostly. Um, and so I have to wonder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a memorial right there at 11th. Uh, yeah. Well, it could be for Mr. Mercer. It's a little park that they put there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a uh, Mercer takes up a good part of that uh, property. And of course, we also have the, the not at 11th, but we also have the the overpass and such in that area as well. Uh, another another drawing uh, views at 8th and Main. And again, Think about 8th and Main now, and I'll kind of give everybody a little bit of homework. Um, drive down Main Street and look at this picture and then drive down Main Street and see what's what's there now and how it compares. Uh, I think, I think some Frazier of these are- Museum, isn't it? Um, yeah, Fra Frazier's between 8th and 9th. Yeah. And um, yeah. It, but look at the roof line. And I think a lot of these buildings actually were rebuilt. Uh, when you when you kind of go through, I've, I've, I've done a little bit of driving around and looking at the having these pictures and saying, I think some of these buildings, in fact, did survive. Because again, if, if all they lost was the roof and maybe this one on the corner needs a little brickwork, uh, it might survive if, if the foundations were still in good shape. Uh, 11th and Market, I, I really like this one. Um, shows again a lot of that debris. What I find interesting is what's right down the middle. Uh, you got yeah. you got roadway and it looks like they've cleared the roadway yeah yeah Maybe. tracks and such yeah. um because again is that going to be in any kind of an emergency is that going to be important yeah yeah you gotta yeah. you gotta have transportation so it i really get the feeling that they cleared that center roadway to mm -hmm. allow traffic to go back and forth for help because again that's one of the things that you're going to have to do pretty quickly is get that roadway open uh, this was a little little dark but same basic idea same roof damage I um, uh, can't really looks like they lost all the glass and at least the what would be the second story can't tell on the first story but uh, you'll also see there's a um, like a little roof area, a little porch area that seems to have survived. Another overview. Uh, this one purports to be at 15th and Chestnut. Don't have any reason to doubt that. Uh, some humans out there in the middle, some damage to upper stories. Um, interesting amount of damage at 15th and Chestnut. A lot of, what are, what are those, what are those buildings that we're looking at? Mostly residences. Yeah. Mostly residences. What's at Fifteenth and Chestnut now? Go take a look. Uh, these are, but these are mostly residences and, and smaller businesses. There's some other images I'm going to show that I, I can't be sure where the locations are because they're not really well indicated, but they're still interesting images. This one does give a, a location, Fifteenth Street. I think it, it's kind of hard to read, but I think that's Fifteenth Street again. Lots of debris, lots of damage. Um, what's over in the right hand, over in the corner over here? And what's still standing over in the corner? Light post. Gas light. light. Post. Yeah. <laughs> a gas yeah. light. When you look That's at all that damage, light. <laughs> and, the, and the gas light is still standing. That really does give you an idea of how oh, precise yeah. that damage can be that if you were to see all that damage in the middle, you know, clearly a structures, the buildings in the back have taken a lot of damage, but the gas light is still standing. Um, those are just always fascinating when you see tornado pictures. 
this is a, a lot of damage, but what's tooling right down the middle of the road? Yeah, trolley. There's, there's the trolley. Uh, yeah, there's Sean, the Sean just let you, Sean let you know there's only three people that have been unmuted. So you're, when you're asking those questions, few can answer, just okay. let you know. Okay. okay. Um, but think, I, I would, some of us just, just think about these areas, guys. Think about, you've got a lot of folks, uh, you know, all those individuals standing around, uh, which would happen today, which would happen today. You would have a lot of individuals showing up to, to see what's going on. Um, but you, got the, but you, still got the, you still got the streetcar running because that's important keeping that transportation line going for humans. Because uh, some of those street cars mm -hmm. run on the wires. I mean, I, the, those street cars, uh, I, I love seeing the street cars in the background. I really want my street cars back. Uh, There's not much of a stop one of those street cars. I mean, they were drawn by mules and all you had to do is clear the debris off the track and you're ready to go. They're getting, it's like, yeah, once you got those, once you got those rails clear, um, they would keep on going and, and you, and they didn't need, obviously, I, I don't know what the clearance rate I would say, but maybe 12 feet, probably, if you, as long as you cleared about 12 feet wide, you were good to go. Uh, and those mules, they, they really did a phenomenal amount of work. And, and again, when you look at these photos, you're going to see, uh, you're going to see wagons, you're going to see the ones being actually on the rails, the, the ones that were truly rail cars versus um, horse-drawn wagons and vehicles of that nature as well. Uh, look at that. Look at the electrical pole, by the way. Again, yeah. a lot of yeah. damage to a roof line. Yeah, look actually, I think those are telegraph poles. Telegraph all, poles. I mean, yeah, all those uh, cross arms indicate their tel telegraph lines. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And I, but look at that. It's still standing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the building behind has taken a tremendous amount of damage, but the pole's still standing. Uh, maybe we should build poles like that now. I don't know how that pole's still standing. More damage. This is a similar image you saw before. It's actually technically a different image, but it's a very similar image, probably taken at about the same time. This is from uh, Harper's Weekly about two weeks, I believe, after the actual tornado struck. Uh, it's got some interesting, uh, interesting pictures. You've got a little bit of a narrative at the bottom. At, in the top corner is Dr. Griffith's house again. Uh, in the middle top, you see that's also Union Station. Uh, some other notations about exactly where these are. The church, uh, St. John's is in the bottom there. Just a tremendous number of pictures, and this, you know, this was a national publication, and this is what people out in the world saw about what happened in Louisville. These were the images that they were going to see when uh, when they heard about what had actually occurred. And what and what's what do you see right in the middle of this image? You see a fire. I mean, that's a lot of fires going to have happened. Another image uh, again somewhat dark but gives a little different angle and a little more close up as to that what I would call a bite uh, out of the building and even clearly there's just something just grabbed this piece of a building but when again when you look farther back in the image you see that telegraph pole still standing and you see the structures um, they may have had some damage to their actual roof but that upper roof line looks to be pretty intact for most of them. I'm sure there's uh, probably actually. Yeah, hey, Sean, we're past three o'clock. I'm not sure how many uh, slides you got, but just uh, heads I'm, up I'm on that. I'm pretty good. We're, we're um, more damage here, you know, more damage, more damage, seeing just a tremendous amount of damage. And I'm just, I'm gonna click through these images, but tremendous amount of dam damage to these, to these structures. What do you think they um, did with all the wood that was, collapsed wood i expect a lot of it got burned and maybe reused i mean if it if it could be reused i suspect they reused it uh -huh. um, if it was simply ripped apart they may have been able to reuse quite a bit of it uh, thinking about is going down waterworks yeah there's our there's what we used to have <laughs> um that got destroyed uh more damage to it um 
we only had enough water for six days. Residents were told to limit their water. But as we may have seen, if you turn engineers use on a problem, they figured out a solution that kept the water pressure up, which was going to be necessary for the firefighting. Yeah. Um, and they were able to get the, the, what we now think of as the water tower was reconstructed very, very quickly. Uh, truly amazes me how quickly they were able to reconstruct a lot of things. But they did get a, a temporary solution that kept the water flowing, which was phenomenal. Law enforcement, uh, we did um, invoke martial law and looters were told they would be shot on site. I don't have any evidence that they actually shot anybody, but they certainly gave everyone warning. Uh, the Louisville Legion, which would be similar, the predecessor to our National Guard, did come out and assist patrol, as you would expect. Uh, firefighting, got to have water to fight fire. Responses were affected by the debris in the roadway, just like it would be today. And of course, built a lot of buildings were ultimately lost due to fire. Um, you know, Louisville Fire Department was in play at that time, and it was already uh, an established. Uh, probably wouldn't get much mutual aid though. Now, now we'd be getting mutual aid from all over, but they would not have really had, there would have been nothing to call upon for mutual aid back then. Yeah. Of course, didn't yeah. have any EMS. You were pretty much hoping that your neighbors liked you well enough to take you to medical aid at that point. And they did. I mean, uh, uh, human nature, people will help. It is, it's always makes my heart feel good to know how many people will come out and assist. Uh, how many died? Jack, you know, we've talked about it. The death register said 78, but um, I guarantee you a lot of other people died later on from as a result of injuries that they sustained. Um, I, I wouldn't even begin to hazard a guess, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't just 78. Uh, that could be attributed to the tornado. There's Mr. Fuller. I always appreciate Mr. Fuller. He's buried in Cave Hill and his family wanted to make sure you knew he died in the cyclone. So he, he put it on his, on his tombstone that he died in the cyclone. Um, they, they just didn't want anybody to doubt that part. Um, could it have been worse? Uh, this was out after normal working hours but there were also a lot of people in that in Falls City Hall. Um, there was a, tr a tremendous rainstorm just before which drove people indoors, which may or may not have been good because again, we have building collapse. Relief and recovery, uh, the Board of Trade Relief Committee basically jumped in play. They provided rent, they provided goods, a lot of vouchers were given so you could go get coal and food. They didn't just hand out cash payments, they provided vouchers to do that. Um, 38 were breadwinners of the folks that they documented. They say 76 here, but that was what was from the Board of Trade, but uh, at least half probably were breadwinners. So they provided pensions to the families and made payments to those who were permanently injured. They did assist with burials. As I mentioned earlier, uh, many of the folks probably could not afford a burial. It, it, they did provide help financially with medical care and burial for victims. Hmm. Indianapolis and Cincinnati provided tarpaulins, uh, which were important as anybody who's ever had something happen to their roof knows. Yeah, need tarpaulin. So they did get a lot of those. Jeffersonville uh, brought over quite a few as well. What's interesting, um, the committee really, really came through. This And this was funded almost entirely by donations from within the city, some from the state, some from people out of state. But the bulk of this money came from other residents of Louisville. Uh, there's some good documentation in the Board of, the Board of Trade document that with this, and, uh, and certainly they did also assist with Parkland and Kane Run. So they were really, really helping the citizens. The city pretty much refused any other aid. Uh, they didn't feel like they needed it, and they said, we're, we're good. Uh, we don't need anything other than those tarpaulins that they accepted. They did get train and telegraph service restored within a few days, which is phenomenal. Uh, they had restored housing within 50 days. So again, think about when the Derby ran, you know, 
So basically the Derby was about six weeks after that. They did run the Derby. Uh, they did do a tremendous amount of restoration within just a couple of months. Toll, five churches, main railroad depot, church schools, factories, warehouses, businesses, at least 532 private dwellings, as well as the damage that was done outside the city. Uh, Two million dollars. OK, that's in 2019. The value of the dollar comparatively was twenty eight sixty. Is that really a fair comparison? I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, it's what, what would it cost? Yeah, when you think about what it would cost to restore all that now, we're into the billions for sure. But this was the number that was given. And I don't have any reason to doubt that they, they tallied it up correctly. Um, many of the buildings were restored. I like this is from the 1892 Sanborn. And it shows that a lot of those buildings, that, that swipe of yellow at the top, is the train shed for the Union Station to kind of give you an orientation. The road right down the middle is seventh. Um, gives you an idea. They really did do quite a tremendous amount of restoration uh, to get those buildings back to be documented on the Sanborn map just a couple of, couple of years later. The science, uh, this probably was an F4 under what we think of now. Uh, the wind would have been in excess of two, 206 miles per hour with, it, with an F4. The swath ranged from about 200 yards wide when it came in up to 500 yards wide when it left 7th Street, when it crossed over the river. That is, uh, for those who are, want to think about the math, that's 1,500 feet. Uh, that's a tremendously wide swath. We weren't alone, as I mentioned at the very beginning, other areas of Kentucky suffered damage. We had, we lost individuals in Hancock due to an F2, 15 were injured there, seven in Ohio County, uh, there's a Grace and Breckenridge track of another F4, not a whole lot of houses in that area, but we did lose a lot of farmland. Uh, they believe an F3 struck Shelby and Henry, and we did obviously lose some individuals uh, here. The last documented that night would have been in Allen and Barron, which was hit by the equivalent of an F3 today. So a lot of tracks. Uh, this little map, again, if you think about it, right in the middle there with that little crooked track, that's Jefferson County. For those who need a little help orienting to the map, um, kind of gives you an idea where those little tornadoes, we've got the one through Jefferson, which is relatively short, a fairly long one across the bottom and some lighter ones as well. Uh, that's that's what the modern day look at what the tracks actually were. Contemporary map at the time, a little more complicated to look at, but uh, gave some a lot of a lot of data on uh, what they knew about it at the time and what the wind speeds and such were. National Weather Service says so this big thing we got from that just a few months later. Uh, President Harrison transferred the responsibilities from the Signal Service over to the U.S. Weather Bureau, which of course is now known as the National Weather Service. So within just a few months, uh, that change. And, and remember, one thing to keep in mind, our tornado 1890 took place about 10 months after the uh, Jonestown, Pennsylvania, Jonestown, Pennsylvania occurred. So we're, we're looking at a lot of other disaster situations that occurred. Last look, uh, that's 10th and Main. I really like that picture. It really gives you a wide sweep of, of how much damage and the activity. I mean, you look at various, you see a couple of wagons, probably people trying to salvage their goods from there. Uh, we don't really know precisely when that picture was taken, but certainly within probably a few days where people were trying to, as people will do after a tornado, salvage what they can. Sean. Uh, we did have, <laughs> that look familiar to anybody? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we did have a monument for the, uh, for the tornado at 7th and Main yes. uh, that's in front of Michter's. Um, it was removed because of the, the positioning was not good for Michter's, quite honestly. It was pretty, it, Michter's did not own it when the, uh, when the monument was built and Michter's wanted it away from their entrance, which I certainly can't blame them because it really was not a good placement. Uh, it is in storage. I have been assured that it is, it is safely in storage. 
Uh, I would love to see it replaced, not in that specific location, but somewhere in a location that would be relevant to where the tornado actually occurred. Now, Sean, uh, it's about 3.15, just to let yeah. you know. Okay. Yeah, well, this, we're, we're wrapping it up here. Um, all my thanks, all I the places that, have, that assisted. And she goes over. <laughs> um, and um, if you want to learn more, this is a book written about it. I did not write it. Kevin McQueen did a great job writing about the Great Louisville Tornado. And I encourage everybody to, to take a look at that book. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it yeah. you want to learn some things from it. People want to unmute and uh, then uh, ask questions they can. Yeah. Can you hear me, Sean? Yes, I sure can. I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna stop sharing at this point so I can okay. see everybody. Just a couple of items. I'll try to get through them quickly. There was mm -hmm. an important, very important building at 10th and Jefferson that was destroyed. It was fairly quickly rebuilt. I just wondered, I don't know if it's in your, I don't think it was in your presentation. It was George Cuscaden's ice cream factory that provided the ice cream for all of the Happy Land uh, stores that were throughout the city. So I- Don't mess with just, my ice cream. That would be bad. Don't mess with my yeah. ice cream. <laughs> uh, the only other thing, and you may have utilized it, this book here, uh, the Louisville Souvenir Scrapbook. It was the South uh, End yes. Optimist Club. Yeah, it's got a whole chapter on the 1890 tornado, mostly uh, mostly pictorial. It's quite good. Mm -hmm. so, I did I did look at that. I don't have a copy. A friend of mine, uh, not reluctantly, but loaned it with a promise that I would give it right back. Uh, I've got mine idea. along with my receipt from the Swan <laughs> Street Antique Mall where I paid twenty dollars um, for it. <laughs> uh, it I, it's, it's one of the that's one of the books that I'm always keeping an eye open for. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. if I ever do see it, um, I will snatch it up. I, I'm not going to say I would pay anything for it, but I'd probably be willing to put, put out a chunk it's of like change for that. Panorama. One. It's, it didn't come out of academia, but it's. Which probably makes it better, actually. <laughs> In a lot of ways, but I, I was able to use a friend of mine's, yes. Are there any other questions? I want to go ahead and wrap this up if I can. Any other questions? Yeah, there's a hand up by uh, Betty. D. Unmute yourself, Betty. Yeah, see, Betty, you, yeah, you were asking the question about the Scientific American. Somebody was asking a question about Scientific American. It's, it's me. Uh, it, it is. I actually got it online, uh, and I'm think I've actually got a digital copy of that article if you'd like to see it uh, I'm more than, I'll, I'll find it and, and, and share it with you but I did actually pull it offline I had to do some digging so but it is available uh, but I do I'm pretty sure I've still got the digital copy that I pulled down from that because it was I, it really have, an interesting article. I have a tornado story my husband's grandfather was born the 3rd of March 1890 his mother was second generation Irish and had the gift of being able to read fortunes with tea leaves and reading her handprint. And she just felt like something bad was about to happen. He was asleep upstairs. So she went up and got him. As she got to the bottom of the steps, there went the, the top half of the roof. Oh, wow. Top half of the floor building. Mm. Hmm. That's wow, significant. Good. That's a good story. Are there a question for, any other questions? Well, I just got a question for Gary Falk. Uh, uh -oh. Gary, did you, get, did you get my article for the newsletter? uh title 